So, uh, welcome everyone uh, to this third webinar uh, from BIOS on uh, core topics. Uh, my name is B. J. Singh. I'm the current uh, president of the uh, British Indian Orthopedic Society. We have an exciting uh, uh, few lectures lined up this morning um, with faculty from across Europe. Um, I'm going to pass you on to Harvinder and Sunil, who are the moderators of this session. Over to you, Harvinda. Okay, thank you, BJ, and welcome everybody. Um, we're quite excited to um, take you through this core topics for trainees on shoulder trauma. And we are going to start off with, um, there, there is a lot of variety of topics, so be prepared to be taken on a journey through uh, management of proximal humerus fracture. So I will start off with Aziz Haq. He's one of our trainees here in Leicester. His post exams is uh, starting his shoulder fellowship in a few months and is um, looking forward to hear from him about fracture patterns on proximal humerus fractures and approaches for shoulder trauma. Over to you, Aziz. Good morning, my name is Aziz Haq and I'm a trainee from Leicester. I'm here to talk about fracture patterns in proximal humerus fractures and approaches that are commonly used in shoulder trauma. I'm going to talk about fracture patterns by talking about nearest classification. That was described many years ago, but it's commonly understood and used both clinically and you'll probably end up using it in the exam. So if they show you a radiograph of a fracture, you'll probably say it's a two, three or four part fracture and then carry on with your spiel. So near essentially broke down the proximal humerus into four parts, the humeral head, the greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, and the shaft components. If you had fracture lines between them and there was no displacement, then it would essentially be a one part fracture or a minimally displaced fracture. Now displacement according to near was at least one centimeter separation between the parts and or angulation of around 45 degrees. Two part fractures, can either be anatomical or surgical neck, greater or lesser tuberosity. And then there are the three and four part fractures. Later on, fracture dislocations were also added onto the classification and they could either be anterior or posterior. And you can once again have two, three or four part fractures. In 2004, Hertel published uh, this paper looking at predictors for humeral head ischemia. Now, they also showed us um, various fracture configurations that we can get in proximal humerus fractures, but the main take home points were predictors of ischemia. Now, they found that the length of a metaphyseal head extension, if that was less than eight millimeters, then uh, that was a good predictor of ischemia. And what do we mean by that? So we're talking about this bone here below the humeral head. Now, if that is less than eight millimeters, then that's a bad sign also integrity of the medial hinge. So if it's off, then that's probably more likely to disrupt the blood supply. And specific fracture patterns. So they suggested um, 2, 9, 10, 11, and 12 were probably more associated with a humeral head ischemia. And that is likely because the humeral head in all these fracture patterns is a separate component altogether. They thought four part fractures, angular displacement of the head, and tuberosity displacement to be moderate predictors of ischemia. Interestingly, glenohumeral dislocations and head split fractures were poor predictors of ischemia. And that's probably because when you look at dislocations, for example, it's a heterogeneous group of fractures. You can either have two, three or four part fractures. So two part fracture dislocations are probably not going to give you the ischemia as much as four part fracture dislocations are. And head split components, once again, they can be different types. You can have the head split where the tuberosities are attached to the uh, respective head components and uh, therefore have good blood supply, or you could have one where the humeral head is a separate component altogether. Moving on to approaches in shoulder trauma, the more common ones are the delta pectoral and anterolateral approach. Posterior approach is less common, but we still need to talk about it because that could come up in the exam. In terms of a delta pectoral approach, it's the workhorse. It's the one we use to uh, fix uh, proximal humerus fractures, perform arthroplasty or stabilization procedures. The main advantage is the potential for extension distally, the fact that it's a good exposure and um, it's an internervous and uses, utilizes an internervous plane. So between the auxiliary and medial lateral pectoral nerves supplying the deltoid and the pec major. The main disadvantage is the access to the greater tuberosity. Now you're going from the front, 
The greater tuberosity is attached to the uh, posterior superior cuff and that's displacing posteriorly. So you need to try and get the cuff back and hold it and reduce it. So that can sometimes be a challenge. When you're talking about the description, you're gonna say, patient will be in a bead chair position. I'm gonna mark out my landmarks, but it's from the coracoid process down towards the deltoid uh, attachment distally. It's gonna be around 10 to 15 centimeters. And once I've gone through the fat and fascia, I'm gonna try and find the interval between the deltoid and the pec major. Now there's usually a fat stripe in between and the cephalic vein also sits in this area. So you, you can take the vein laterally and then you're down to the calvopectoral fascia. You're gonna feel for the coracoid and visualize the conjoint tendon underneath, stay lateral to it and incise the fascia to get down into your subscapularis tendon. Now in trauma, that's probably the end of your approach because if it's a four part fracture or whatever, you're going to be looking for the fracture fragments. If it was arthroplasty in elective practice, then you would be thinking about tenotomizing uh, the subscapularis tendon. The anterolateral approach for trauma, um, the main indications would be when you're nailing or fixing the GT in proximal humerus fractures, or if you're, pro or if you're trying out, or sorry, if you're performing a minimally invasive fixation. The main advantage is the access to the tuberosity and the fact that it's much less in terms of soft tissue dissection. The main disadvantage is the limited extension distally, and that's because the auxiliary nerve is sitting, sitting there. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So your description is beat chair position, um, you're marking out your landmarks and essentially going down uh, in the anterior third of your acromion, uh, uh, down uh, along the humeral axis. You know, skin incision probably doesn't need, shouldn't be any more than about five centimeters below the, um, below the acromion. To, try and protect the axillary nerve. Once you're down through the skin and fat, you're going to be looking for the raphate that sits between the um, clavicular and your chromial parts of your deltoid. That's usually a little white line. And once you've got, once you incise that and go through and split the deltoid, then you're down into the uh, bursa, bursal tissue. Once you've excised that or incised it, then you're down to the fracture fragments. The auxiliary nerve needs to be always be, you need to always be aware that the auxiliary nerve is there to try and protect it. If you're going to try and plate the proximal humerus from this approach, then you need to stay subperiosteal and you need to give yourself uh, an area where you do not dissect into. So that's about two or three centimeter area below your five centimeter line. So the posterior approach is infrequently used, but you would use it for glenoid fractures or scapular fractures. The internervous approach is between the uh, axillary nerve supplying the teres minor and the suprascapular nerve supplying the infraspinatus. You, when describing it, the patient can either be in a prone position or a lazy lateral. Now your skin incision can be a variety of types. It can either be a bit more vertical when you're just interested in the glenoid. And in that case, you're gonna be splitting the deltoid Remember, you can't go too far down because of the auxiliary nerve here. Or if you need to plate the whole uh, scapula, then you would, your skin incision will probably be a bit more um, uh, oblique because you're going to, be, you're going to need to dis detach the deltoid from the scapula, the spine of the scapula. And that can either be an osteoperiosteal flap or a bit of tissue left behind, which you can repair back to. Once you've gone through the deltoid, then you, you want to find the plane between the teres minor and the infraspinatus and that's your internervous plane. Sometimes you may need to go above if you want to try and get down to, uh, if you want to work slightly higher, but um, in that case, you're splitting the infraspinatus and the main risk is the suprascapular nerve medially. Now, thank you very much. Right, thank you um, to Aziz. Um, so we can take a couple of questions at this stage if anybody has any burning questions uh, or we can take them right at the end as well. If Please put any questions on the chat box if you have any and we can take it up with the speaker. They're all here listening live. Um, so if there are any questions, please put them on the chat box. Um, so I think, um, Aziz, I have just got a question, you know, which approach uh, or actually which classification system do you like and, um, you know, do you find them easy to use? Um, 
I think uh, clinically I, I end up using a combination. Um, Terminology-wise, it's very common to use um, uh, NEARS classification where you're calling them out as two or three or four part fractures. But in reality, you're also looking at fracture patterns. So I think sometimes you end up looking at fractures and, you, and you're trying to decide whether they are two or three or four parts, but then also deciding whether they're valgus, uh, valgus type fractures or various type fractures, whether it's an associated dislocation. So I don't think there's one classification that I would necessarily use, but I think when we're speaking to each other, we do end up using the terminology from near. Um, the other thing is there are other classifications like the AO classification. And the problem with both near and, uh, and applic applying them to clinical practice is that there is a lot of inter-observer inter and intra-observer uh, reliability issues. Um, sometimes if you have further imaging in terms of CT scans, you can improve that reliability, but there's still, there can still be quite a lot of uh, variability. So I think that they, they can be difficult to apply, but um, in general, we end up using uh, terminology from NEARS classification when we're talking to each other. All right. Thank you, Aziz. I think we'll go on to our uh, next talk, Sunil. So um, I'd like to present the talk from Alison Armstrong. She's one of my colleagues here, a senior shoulder surgeon uh, in Leicester. And she's going to talk about decision-making in proximal humerus fractures. And hopefully her talk will make it easier to understand the difficulties we come across when we see these fractures. Thank so you, Arvinder. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be discussing with you and about decision making in proximal humeral fractures. Uh, now, this is a very important subject. Uh, it's right that you should learn how uh, to fix these fractures. But the most important thing is that for the patient sitting in front of you, you make that very difficult decision to decide whether to fix the fracture. And that's something that requires skill and judgment. So there are five things that I think you need to consider and you have some fractures on the right hand side, you might like to think for yourself whether you would fix these fractures. Number one, what am I trying to achieve? And function is the most important of all, but being pain free and having a good range of movement is also important. Secondly, what about the fracture configuration? Can I make it look better? But also, will it work any better? Thirdly, can the patient survive the anaesthetic? And will the patient do physiotherapy? Not particularly important for patients with dementia. And finally, what's the neurological situation? So, what am I trying to achieve? The single most important thing for the humerus is that it is intact. Because its job at the most basic is to be a post where you can position the hand in space. After you have that, you want it to be pain-free, both for the patient and also pain-free when it moves. And thirdly, you want movement. Now, fortunately, little movement is required for many activities of daily living, such as eating, drinking, and toileting, as illustrated by the girl on the uh, picture below. But you require more for dressing, washing your hair, for jewellery and for full independence, as shown by the picture on the right hand side. You must know what the likely range of movement is that you will achieve for each type of fracture. Of course, uh, getting that will depend on them complying with physiotherapy. But with the best physiotherapy, some fractures have a limited range of movement. So for a tuberosity, you may expect 90% movement. For a two-part two fracture, perhaps 60 to 70%. But when you get to a three or four-part fracture, even with something that is essentially uh, undisplaced, to get 90 degrees of elevation, 60 degrees of abduction, and 30 degrees of external rotation uh, is about what you might expect, irrespective of what you do. Next decision is, well, can I make the fracture look any better? Now, clearly, if it's an off-ended fracture, whether it's two, three, or four part, the chances are that you can put those two bits together and it will function better because you'll have a post for your hand. Perhaps for pain or function, you might consider a displaced greater tuberosity fracture where the, great, the tuberosity fragment might get in the way as it sits between the humeral head and the acromion. Some fractures are more at risk of a non-union, such as a varus fracture. It's not an absolute, but it's something to consider. 
But then what about those ones that are angulated and depressed? Will it work any better? Poor bone stock usually means that we can't move the fracture immediately and so post-operative stiffness is a problem. And now I'm going to discuss the PROFA study. This is a very important study. If you haven't read the paper, may I encourage you to do so. It was a non-operative versus any operation randomised trial of two, three and four part fractures in, and it was done in hospitals in the UK. The surgeon obviously had to be in equipoise. So it was the sort of fracture was displaced, but well, is it displaced enough that I think I can make a good different, a difference to this patient? There was some variation between surgeons, but all surgeons entered patients into both arms, so that cancelled that out. These were the results. The Oxford shoulder score was the same at two and five years for both groups. Here's the graph. This paper, the two-year paper, is published in JAMA and the five-year paper published in the BJJ. Now, it was a controversial paper. And when people don't like a paper and they don't like what it says, then they start to try and do it down and rubbish it. And that certainly happened with this paper. I'm an examiner. I've heard a lot of myths about this paper from people who clearly haven't read it. So here's some. It was only two part fractures in. No. Of the 250 patients, 77% were near three or four. Only a small proportion of patients in the total um, group were, um, were in the study. Well, no, 45% of the total were eligible, but 55% were ineligible, mostly because they were not fit for surgery. What difference does this study make to people's practices? Well, from where I am, if you're uncertain as to whether to operate or not, you do not need to. Here's a lady, I didn't see her till two or three weeks of, um, after her fracture, and I think had I seen her, um, I maybe initially I might have been tempted to consider surgery. She wasn't terribly fit. But as you can see, this fracture healed, and by 10 weeks, she'd already got about 80%, 80 degrees of elevation. Um, and she was happy and she was pain free. The third thing, of course, that they must do is survive the anaesthetic. Shoulder surgery is one to two hours of sitting upright, a block, but usually subsidation or a GA, and they may you, you lose up to a unit of blood. Do take account of their fitness. If you don't think they're fit, get a high risk assessment. But remember the pro for outcomes. Things may not be so bad. I certainly on occasions um, in the, uh, had a patient who was in the middle of chemotherapy. And I waited till they'd finished that chemotherapy until we fixed the fracture. And they do physiotherapy. Well, I usually tell them up front, it's six to nine months of very hard work for them to get to their best. Because if you don't tell them, they lose heart and give up, or they think something's wrong. Are they able to do physio? Patients with dementia can't do physiotherapy. I go for getting function and accept a poorer range of movement. Some people have very chaotic lives, such as alcoholics, and they may not comply. And they may also fall again. And so sometimes non-operative management is a good idea. What's the neurological situation? If they have a dense nerve palsy, either usually axillary, but it could be a radial or even both. That function is unlikely to return for it ever, maybe, or at least six months. So the operation is then of less value because the patient is going to get stiff anyway. So you may be better off to accept the position and accept poor movement. So you end up with a series of things that will tilt you towards operation and tilt you away from operation. Your job as a surgeon is to decide which way you are going to fall. So for an offended fracture um, or a fracture of the tuberosity, maybe in varus, you, you might want to operate. A fit, mentally well patient that's committed to physio will certainly encourage you to operate and one with normal nerve function. But because they're unfit doesn't mean you won't operate. It just means that's one more thing against operation. And a patient with dementia still needs a post to be, for, for an arm in order to be able to feed themselves and do what they can. And so I may operate if they have dementia. At the end, you need to weigh up the balance. 
need to explain the evidence to the patient and the carer. This is a life-changing injury. No operation will restore full range of movement. Explain the pro for study if it's relevant. It is not about speed of recovery. Discuss the physiotherapy and the neurology of the patient and make a shared decision. Now here's an example of a difficult decision. When I, if I saw that fracture there, I think I'd be wanting to fix that fracture. I'd personally be wanting to nail it. This patient was in their 80s. They were right-handed. They had a cardiac history and they also had dementia. I think I would still have fixed this fracture with that. However, it had a dense axillary and radial nerve palsy. And so with that, a decision was made not to operate on this patient. Now, this x-ray is actually taken at two to three weeks, and you can see that there is a little bit of callus there. You won't get a good range of movement. But she's never going to because of her axillary and radial nerve palsy. In conclusion, function is the most important. It's a life-changing injury. Operative, the fragments are widely apart to avoid a non-union. Some fractures may not look great, but function and range of movement is the same. Consider profer if it's relevant. Think about the patient's anaesthetic and mental fitness. Discuss the physiotherapy that they'll require and consider neurological damage. Explain the evidence and share the decision with the patient and the carer. Thank you. Right, thank you to Alison. Uh, I think this was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I was going to ask her a question, whether she's regretted uh, operating on a patient and why did she regret? And she came up with a very difficult uh, presentation that she had to go through. And I'll, I'll try and present you that at the end. It's a very interesting case. I'm sure you, should, you need to wait to listen to that one. Sunil, do you have any questions? Should we go on to the next one? No, I think uh, uh, Alison explained it quite well, particularly the prof study and its context as to whenever you have an equipoise, that's where you want to really uh, consider the prof study. But if, you, if you're clear in your mind that the, the, the fracture pattern is such that the greater tuberosity is, is uh, relatively displaced and the patient is young with high functional demand, or if the shaft indeed is, is, is grossly displaced, then in these cases, I don't, I don't think prof study applies, then you have to go in and operate because uh, the evidence is outcomes are better if you get the anatomical alignment. But of course, if the patient's age is, is towards in the, in the 70s, 80s, if the functional demands are not the best, then uh, not, not great, then obviously uh, I think you are in, in a state of equipoise there. And, and so that, that, that message was delivered quite clearly by uh, Alison and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Right. If there are no questions on the chat box, then I think we will move on to the next talk. The next presentation is from uh, Mr. Radhakant Pandey. He's also, again, one of the senior children and elbow surgeon here in Leicester and my uh, colleague. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about non-operative management of proximal humerus fractures. Thanks, uh, Sunil. Good morning, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about non-operative management of proximal humeral fractures. If you look at this x-ray, there is a well-healed proximal humeral fracture with the implants in place. On the whole, you'll say it's a pretty good fixation. But unfortunately, the patient is not very happy. She has restricted range of movement and still has some pain. On the other side, we have this fracture of the proximal humerus who was listed for surgery on my list and we've had a chat and decided to treat this non-operatively. This fracture went on to heal, although not perfect, but the patient is quite happy. They've got good range of movement and virtually no pain. There's another fracture with significant loss of contact between the humeral head and the, and the shaft, which we treated non-operatively and has gone on to unite, and we have a very satisfied customer. So what I'm trying to say is surgical treatment is being increasingly used in the proximal humeral fracture. However, a Cochrane review found insufficient 
evidence. So surgery for displaced fracture of the proximal humerus may not result in better outcomes than non-surgical management. We all shoulder surgeons have a collection of these you know, failed implants, broken implants, avascular necrosis, not properly done surgery. And we all know revising these or doing a second surgery is so much more difficult than operating on a shoulder which has not been touched by a surgeon before. I am not saying you don't operate on proximal humor fractures. There are plenty of cases where you need surgery, very displaced tuberosity, fracture dislocations, head split fractures, very badly broken proximal humor fractures, significant displacement with, with no bone on bone contact. So these are all will benefit from surgical intervention. However, I'm talking about patients where there's not a lot of displacement or the, the, the mechanics of the fracture are in a reasonable place. The tuberosity is in the right place and the, uh, the humeral head is facing the right direction. There's reasonable contact between the head and the shaft. So a lot of these fractures I would suggest to you can be treated without surgery. Uh, even if you get a malunion, a lot of elderly folks, they, they, uh, uh, they can manage very well what we term as acceptable malunion. Now, here's a lady who's very happy with the outcome, despite the tuberosity is quite high, and, but the fracture is united, and she, she's able to do most of her activities of daily living. Now, this brings us nicely to the profile trial, which all of you know. It is a trial, it's a pragmatic trial, and basically the patients who were put in this trial were patients in whom their surgeon was in equipoise, meaning he was not so sure as to whether to operate on these fractures or not operate. So these group of patients were put in, randomized and put into this trial into a surgical and a non-surgical group. And they were reviewed at two years. And they found no difference between surgical group and the non-surgical group at two years. So these results do not support the increasing trend of surgery in proximal humeral fractures. However, this trial does not say you should not operate on proximal humeral fractures, only if you are in equipoise. That is, you're not entirely certain whether you should operate or not operate. Those group of patients, if you don't operate, you'll get as good a result without the risk of surgery. So if you have a fracture in front of you, how do you decide to treat this non-operatively? It actually depends on the functional demand of the patient and the comorbidity they have. Elderly can tolerate fair amount of malunion, called the acceptable mal malunion. And you, the, the younger patients, you may want to treat them differently but a lot of these fractures can also be treated non-operatively. Tuberosity displacement has to be acceptable. There should not be any head split. Uh, one also assesses the risk of non-union. If you feel that this fracture has got a very high risk of non-union, then you may want to intervene early. A lot has been said about the contact between the shaft and the head. Uh, I think even a little bit of contact will be okay as long as the tuberosities in the head are in the right, reasonably uh, right place. Uh, one needs to watch two part surgical and fractures with regular x-rays. And if you feel the head is drifting, uh, especially in a young patient, if it's drifting in varus, you may want to intervene early. If you do decide to treat patients non-operatively, what do you do? I mean, also, again, it depends on the displacement of the tuberosities. If the tuberosities are very displaced, you may want to be less aggressive in your uh, mobili re mobilization and rehab. But I put patients in the sling for about two weeks. Sometimes the gravity helps in getting the position is a bit better. Not always. But, I, but you don't want to keep them in a sling for very long. You want to mobilize as early as possible. So I start Pendula in about two weeks time after an X-ray and passive and assist her three, active in four, but don't start strengthening two to three months. This is a rough guideline. Of course, you'll have to individualize the uh, 
treatment depending on the patients. Now here you see a pretty uh, nasty looking fracture, but if you look closely, the tuberosities are in a reasonable place. The head is facing the right direction. The shaft has got reasonable contact. So we decided to treat this non-operatively. And this fracture starts to heal and healed. And they have a very happy patient who's got reasonable function and very little pain. So in conclusion, I would say, if you are in equipoise, when you see an X-ray and you feel, hmm, I'm not so certain, the X-ray looks pretty reasonable, everything is in roughly in the right place, uh, and I'm not certain whether I should operate or not operate, choose non-operative treatment because you'll get as good a result with non-operative treatment as surgery. Assess the functional demands of the patient and the co-body. They'll have a say in how you treat that fracture. A lot of the elderly patients, you can accept a lot of uh, malunion. Assess the risk of non-union. This is important and it's difficult. It, doesn't, it takes a lot of experience to assess that risk. And the displacement of tuberosity is important in making your decision whether to operate or not to operate. Again, that also takes a bit of experience. The tuberosities can displace about a centimeter in either direction. If the, body, if the head is in the right place, facing the right way, and there is some contact in between the shaft and the head, you may consider non-operative management. So majority of the proximal humeral fractures are treated non-operatively. Even the displaced ones, a lot of them do well with non-operative treatment. You just need to assess the fracture and match it to the patient's demand and you will come to a good conclusion. Thanks. Right, thanks to um, Mr. Pandey. Um, I think Mr. Pandey is here. I've got a question for you. Uh, this has come from Jab Willems. He's asking, what is your ratio of surgery versus conservative treatment for proximal humerus fractures in your practice? Ms. Pandey, you'll have to unmute. So, uh, off the top of, the, top of my head, I would say 85%, almost 80 to 85% I'll treat non-operatively and about 15 to 20% I will need, I will not treat surgically. I have uh, another question, Mr. Pandey. This has come from John Edwin. He's asking, is there a way of telling which greater tuberosity fractures are likely to migrate? <clears throat> is there any uh, thoughts well, on that? It, it, is, uh, it is difficult, but, but one of the ways you, that's why you take serial x-rays. You take x-ray at one week and two weeks. However, if the, frac the biggest uh, marker is how much it was displaced in the first place, if the fracture is a tuberosity fracture is cracked and it's remained in place, those ones are less likely to displace in the future. However, if the tuberosity is broken and already displaced up to about a centimeter, either more importantly, they've gone a bit posteriorly, then you need to watch them like with, with, uh, closely with x-rays. But if they have not displaced in the first place, then they very they, they don't displace further, but you even those you need to X-ray every week at least for the first two weeks to make sure they don't displace. Uh, uh, yeah, Monty, can I ask you? Uh, there's there's a question from uh, Mikhil Jain. So what he's he's asking you is essentially about the usage of sling. So based on your presentation, does it imply that you do not use sling after two weeks, or you use it for three weeks or more? So it all, it's, as I said, you, you have to individualize to every patient. Uh, it all depends on how badly the tuberosities are broken and how badly, uh, how badly displaced the fracture is. So generally two weeks, uh, don't ask me why, but two weeks, things start to gum up. Uh, after two weeks, you need to start to mobilize them. Now, whether you keep the sling or not, you can still mobilize them. They can take the sling off and start pendular exercises and at three weeks start assisted active exercise and put the spling back on if it's a very displaced fracture. But after beyond three weeks, I very rarely keep the sling. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's I think across the board, yeah. 
can I? I'm sorry for this, uh, Harvinder, but there's a question we missed, which is quite relevant for Ali Armstrong, which is, which is about uh, if you have a proximal humerus fracture, and maybe Monty can also answer and chip in his views. Uh, if you have a proximal humerus fracture and you have auxiliary nerve palsy, question is from Kunal Kulkarni. At what stage will you refer the patient to a peripheral nerve injury unit, or would you explore it straight away at your place? Um, I think the um, anybody who's interested in in the what you do with these nerve injuries, I would um, encourage you to look at the recent BESS um, symposium on nerve injuries at the uh, BESS meeting. There's some very good talks by a chap called Quick from the Royal National. Um, but I think what the, nerve nerve studies it's very difficult to interpret them under a month. So the first thing is you almost always wait a month. Um, the second thing is that. Uh, as he said, uh, sometimes the, there's a there's a block to conduction, but it's going to um, it's going to come back. Um, the th and the third thing is that if there turns out there's a big hematoma there, then you, around the nerve, then you may get scarring, and if you get scarring, then you will almost get compression of the nerve. Uh, that's more difficult to ascertain um, without some form of imaging. So what he did say was that nerve injuries, if they are going to be explored, the best results are if they're explored less than three months. So you have got three months. He said four to six, it's okay, but when you get to nine to 12, it's um, very, very difficult and a disaster. Um, I think that the, 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 one of the things about the nerve injury is, okay, well, when did it happen? So for that lady uh, that I showed, almost certainly that nerve injury happened at the time of her injury because that's when the maximum force was applied. Um, yes, you could say, well, is it possible that the nerve is tented um, over, the, um, over the, uh, the fracture? I think in her case, probably not, because I don't think it's displaced enough, but that, it, that can be um, an issue. So I think the answer to your strict question is um, that I think you probably need to wait for a month. Now, uh, Quick did say when you do ask for nerve conduction studies, you need to be really careful that you ask for what you what you really want them to look for, because otherwise you may get something that doesn't actually give you the answer. So the answer you want to know is, is the nerve in continuity. Chances are for a low velocity fracture like hers was, it probably will be. But the second thing is, is there any sign of recovery? So is there a block um, or, or is there is there signs of ongoing denervation? And I think the... Um, I think if you're going to explore those nerves, um, then I mean, it has to be somebody who's used to exploring those nerves and an expert in doing that. Because um, as, it, as they explained in the, in the talk, um, you, you may be able to just do a neurolysis, but in fact, um, you may end up doing far more than that. Um, and in which case you need to be experts at doing um, uh, putting um, uh, grafts across nerves and things like that, which is very, which is certainly more than um, a, an average. It's something that we wouldn't do. Um, so I, I think the answer is that you probably wait a month. You ask for very careful nerve conduction studies, and you um, are very specific about what you want to know, uh, and you hope to get those done by somebody that you trust. Um, and that if you're, it's probably reasonable to wait a month. Um, but I think you should, at that point, um, uh, consider at least discussing it with the peripheral nerve injury unit. They were very encouraging of being having somebody ring them up early rather than later, because if you are going to operate, you should do it by three months. Thank you, Alison. One, I one more thing up. I would say is when you examine the patient initially, uh, it is always very difficult to look at axillary nerve or examine them clinically but sometimes you can see that they are recruiting their deltoid. Yeah. If you examine them, you have to make take their clothes off and see if they can abduct or forward elevate whatever little they can and see if the deltoid is firing. If the deltoid is firing, that's a good sign. If the del many times the deltoid would not fire because of pain. Uh, so that's another thing I wanted to add, but yes, I mean, all the other things what Alison has said is absolutely right. It has to be explored within three months if, need, if it needs exploring. I think the other thing he was very keen on was a very careful um, clinical examination that probably goes a bit more than what you might normally do in the clinic, in that you're going to look at muscle power, but you need to look at sensation. 
and you need to look at pain and you need to look at temperature. And he had an acronym, um, <laughs> which ends with professional, but I actually can't remember the acronym. So um, I encourage you to go and listen to the talk, but hopefully I've remembered the essential things. Because the other thing he said was that if it's a conduction block, um, it may well be that the um, some of these, there may be bits, you, you may find it's not as complete as you expect. And obviously, if it's an incomplete um, nerve injury, then again, the chances for recovery are much higher. Lovely. Thank you, Alison. I think we'll have to move on. Um, uh, Sunil, will you uh, start the next talk from Kapil, please? Um, so the next talk is from uh, Mr. Kapil Kumar. He's a senior shoulder and elbow surgeon from Aberdeen. He's joined us uh, here as well. He's going to talk about his take on fixation techniques in proximal humerus fractures. Thank you, Sunil. Yeah. Hi, I'm going to be talking about fixation techniques in proximal humeral fractures. Decision-making in proximal humeral fractures regarding treatment is based on patient factors and the fracture pattern. We need to know what uh, is our patient's activity level, age, expectations, underlying bone density, because as we know, these fractures do occur in the elderly population with osteoporosis. Smoking is a big factor for consideration. And then we have to look at specifically the fracture factors. I believe that you've had a talk on classification of these fractures, and this is the hurdle classification, uh, which looked at risk factors for AVM, and the RESH classification. Whichever classification system you do, it should aid in you making a decision about the fracture itself. So a number of uh, treatment options are available for um, treatment of these proximal humeral fractures. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on fixation techniques, which are MUN percutaneous wiring, open reduction gun fixation with a locking plate, or intramural renealing. The x-ray that you see on your right, uh, I'll leave it in your thoughts and make a plan as to how you would like to fix this fracture, if at all, whether you'd like to pin it, uh, fix it with a plate or nail it. So when we aim or go down the route of surgical treatment, our aims are to achieve an adequate reduction of the fracture with a fixation method that gives us adequate stability, uh, allowing us for early mobilization of the limb, and at the same time, preserving the soft tissues or reconstructing them uh, so that we get a low outcome with a low complication rate. So we need a good hold in the humeral head, good hold in the humeral shaft, restoring the mechan biomechanics, um, and at the same time, minimize any acute uh, iatrogenic injury to the soft tissues or the neurovascular structures in the vicinity. So percutaneous spinning was first introduced by Herbert Resch uh, in 1997 uh, in this paper, and they used a variety of uh, techniques to reduce this very complex fracture. And some of the X's in their paper are quite impressive. They use percutaneously inserted elevators to reduce the fracture and to, and to fix them with K wires, some of which were replaced with screws, while the others were held in a little block outside the body. But the disadvantage was that you needed a second procedure to remove these pins. Uh, th the Lester group uh, present, uh, published their results using a modified uh, RASH technique where they replaced all the, the wires with percutaneously inserted cannulated screws. Then we get onto the more invasive ways of fixing these fractures, which are using <coughs> locking plates, which have really become very popular over the last decade or so, or intermetral renealing. Nailing has got the advantage. It is a mechanically stronger construct, uh, being closer, uh, being closer to the medullary canal. But the challenge is to achieve reduction with minimally invasive technique. And of course, when you insert the cuff, uh, insert the nail through the rotator cuff, you cause damage to the rotator cuff. And also, uh, reduction of tuberosities can be a challenge. Pascal Bolo's group published their results. Uh, 
uh, last year with what they call as a third generation terminal nail, which is essentially a straight nail. And the entry point is much medial to the conventional entry point uh, near the cuff insertion. And this th thereby goes through the muscular portion of the rotator cuff, uh, minimizing hydrogenic damage to the cuff insertion. And they uh, use it for uh, humor, uh, surgical neck fractures and reported excellent results in their paper. Just a year before, uh, sorry, about a few years ago, there was a prospective randomized control trial which looked at I am nailing for uh, two or three part proximal humeral fractures uh, compared with locking plates. And they reported uh, that the clinical and radiological results were similar, but there was a higher complication and reoperation rate in the nailing group. So again, we are not very clear as to what implant is most suitable for fracture, I guess depends on your personal experience. Uh, plate fixation, <laughs> as you can see, uh, is one of the most commonly used techniques that we use uh, these days. You can do it either through a delta petro approach or a deltoid splitting approach. The advantage of the deltoid split approach is that it's much easier to mobilize the greater velocity, which usually gets retracted posteriorly and it also preserves the medial soft tissues, thereby reducing the risk of avascular necrosis. But one has to be mindful of the auxiliary nerve. And when I use this approach, I like to expose the auxiliary nerve and then slide the plate underneath it. So let's look at the results of plating. If you go back in 2010, this paper <coughs> looked at uh, use of locking plates in the treatment of proximal humeral fractures, and they concluded that uh, although the procedure can be performed safely with good results, but surgeons should be aware that complications can arise. And about a decade later, we still have a similar problem where the conclusions are that locking plate fixation of proximal humeral fractures continues to be associated with high complication rate. So what are these complications uh, with the use of locking plates for proximal humor fractures? And these are the few four top ones, apart from the usual surgical complications. But here you've got screw penetration into the humeral head, various collapse, tuberosity, malunion, and impingement. And we're just going to look at each of the, these individually as to what we can do to prevent them. If you look at overall incidence of screw penetration, uh, it's nearly 10%. And it can happen either at the time of the surge, initial operation, when one is not very careful uh, <clears throat> in identifying it, or it can occur later on when there is a collapse at the fracture site. So what are the tips to avoid screw penetration while doing initial surgery? Uh, aim to place your screw tips at least five millimeters away from the subcontrol bone. I tend to drill um, in reverse and then insert my screws. And you take multiple images in multiple planes. Uh, and just a little word of advice, do a fluoroscopy at the end, put the shoulders through full range of motion in rotation to make sure that none of these screws is penetrating. And if you're in doubt, change and replace the screw. Various collapse is the other big complication with rates up to about 18% uh, <clears throat> in various series. And the reason this happens is because of primarily surgical error where in, either, either we don't reduce the fracture well or we do not have good support in the region of the calcar. So how can you avoid that? Anywhere we in various, uh, various uh, fractures, you see there is a lot of metaphysical combination and loss of bone in this area. And I tend to pack this with um, go to the Gonzalez bone or a bone graft substitute to get some uh, mechanical integrity in this uh, area to prevent the collapse. Mike Robinson published his technique about 10 years ago where he used a big chunk of um, cortical allograft in this area fixed with screws. And he showed that this did prevent, um, 
uh, was useful in fractures with the severe varus deformity and leading uh, and preventing further varus collapse. You can use an intramedullary fibrillar allograft, and that's probably better than using an endosteal implant, which has got its own problems. So the key points for preventing various collapse are achieve adequate reduction, fill the medial vo void with either bone graft or some kind of cement. You can use a structural graft like a cortical graft as per Robinson or a fibular um, allograft. Endosteal implants, they did have a period of vogue a few years ago when people used to put a meat plate on the medial aspect, but I think that has got its own problems and try and avoid that. The calcar screws are very important to ensure you get support in the region of, in the medial uh, calcar area, but they are also a good indicator that your plate is at the correct height. And we'll look at uh, plate height in a second, but if your calcar screw is just on the calcar as it is in these um, drawings here, your plate for height is optimal and you've achieved a good reduction of the fracture. Tuberosity malunion is the other big complication and the way to avoid that is to mobilize the tuberosities with sutures to the rotator cuff, secure the tuberosities to the plate, uh, to, sorry, to the bone um, and to each other before you put the plate on and then further use these sutures to secure the tuberosities to the plate itself. And if you don't get the plate height right, you may end up with uh, impingement of the plate, which is either the plate is too high or there has been subsequent various collapse of the um, head. As you can see in this x-ray, there has been a lot of technical problems. There's chorocord osteotomy, they've used a medial plate, but the plate is, the, the locking plate is still too high and is gonna cause uh, problems with impingement and these screws will penetrate because inevitably there will be a degree of various collapse in this fracture. Uh, head ischemia is a well-known complication, and as we've said with Hertel's classification, if the, the bad prognostic signs are if the metaphyseal extension is less than 8 millimeters, there is disruption of medial hinge, or there is a fracture to the anatomical neck. The surgical approach also makes a difference. Um, there is less risk of AVN with a delta split force than with a delta petro approach, predominantly because the, minim, the, the medial soft tissues and have, are less disrupted in uh, a deltoid split approach rather than a deltoid pectoral approach. So going back to the original x-ray that I showed you, um, food for thought, I don't know what you have thought about it, but I went and plated it through a deltoid split approach, isolated the axillary nerve, fixed with a free loss plate and got this result. So in summary, fixation of proximal femoral fractures can be challenging because of the fracture configuration and poor bone stock. Um, there is a high complication, especially uh, if we do not see adequate reduction and provide medial calcar support, which may lead to various collapse. You can use a bone graft in this area to uh, and achieve adequate reduction. And please use fluoroscopy to check screw position to avoid any uh, delayed screw penetration. Stabilization and reduction and stabilization of tuberosities is crucial, so use sutures in the tuberosities to mobilize the tuberosity to achieve adequate reduction. Thanks very much. Right, thanks to <clears throat> Kapil, that was a very interesting talk. Um, there are no questions on the chat. I would like to start, Kapil. Um, you know, when you talk to these patients who are coming to you for surgery, what are the key things you tell them? You know, what can they expect from surgery? Is this something you have a, a method for? Yeah, thanks, Aminder. I think the first thing is, of course, the decision-making, which Alison took us through about decision-making fractures. So I presume we have made a decision that we are going to operate on them. And then you have to discuss the, the usual risks and complications, but specifically about shoulder function. I think I really, I don't, I don't use the statistics, but Alison said 90%, 60%, 70%, et cetera. But I think that's a very useful uh, way of looking at it. One has to remind the patient that it is a significant injury and whatever we do, it's unlikely that they will go back to their you know, normal 100% shoulder function. I think we have to be very mindful of that and sort of temper our patient's expectations. Uh, most of the patients, I would say that 
they will get reasonable good function where they can maybe get their arm above shoulder level. That's the whole aim of doing an operation. If I can't achieve that, then there was probably no point in doing the operation, but there will be some restrictions in shoulder function, some terminal restriction movements. The other thing that you have to sort of warn them is the, the whole risks, you know, the risk of avascular necrosis, which still exists, tuberosity escape. And I think there is a lot of unrecognized stiffness that we sort of, we think it's a consequence of just a fracture or whatever, but there are on occasions where I've had gone and done an arthrolysis and a subversal arthrolysis that a capsular release inside the shoulder, which has improved shoulder movements. Again, one has to be mindful of that. There may be adhesions, not only intra-articular, but extra-articular adhesions in, under the deltoid in that region as well, which you might need to operate on. Uh, but again, the usual risks about neurovascular injury, about avascular necrosis, et cetera. So, you know, it's very interesting that my next door neighbor had a proximal humeral fracture and all of my colleagues said, don't operate on him. You know, you will never see him again. He's a keen golfer and you will do it. You know, I struck it lucky. He's gone back to playing golf and he still talks to me. So yes, you know, <laughs> but- uh, That's a good outcome. <laughs> yeah. Up Thank you. Kapil, can I quickly ask you about the use of fibular grafts? Because that's uh, a lot in vogue these days, isn't it? Fibular graft and people talk about that. So do you have that available in your unit before you operate on any, any such tricky fracture? Or do you, you, you are very selective about its use? So personally, Sunil, I've never used a fibular allograft. I, because A, it is not readily available. You have to order it. I think uh, we also have to get it from Liverpool. Yeah. Uh, I tend to, uh, what I've found out is that that huge deficient area in the metaphysis on the medial side, I think that's the key. And I just, in fact, we, we've got these cortical cancellous freeze-dried bone chips, yeah. and I just pack it like impaction grafting. And it's very interesting that once you've done that, in fact, one of my registrars pointed me and said, oh, your technique, you know, that's great once you've done that, and you just hold it with one wire and the whole construct moves as one. And if you've achieved that, you have probably got enough mechanical integrity to there. Is there a difference between using a fibular allograft or these cortical bone chips, which are ess essentially providing you mechanical integrity in that? That's fine. The X-ray looks pretty weird after these sort of um, hydroxyapatite granules or the bone chips, but I've not had any problems with that. And that probably is a big factor in reducing the risk of various collapse. Yeah, completely agree. That's, that's I would echo that completely. I think uh, can I make a comment, please, uh, on what about the bone graft? Is that what we have is we don't have the fresh frozen on shelf anyway, uh, but we have the freeze dried, and I've used that as well, and that works reasonably well uh, because what it does it provides that initial stability when you are struggling with the virus uh, reduction, you know, getting the virus alignment. So maybe that's something to try, Kapil. Uh, Kapil, I have a question here from um, Saurabh Agrawal asking, you know, when you use K-wires, uh, what kind of post-op management technique do you have for those patients? You know, patients who are having those wires put in, if you have to use wires. You know what? I'm not going to answer that question. I think Mr. Pandey needs to answer that question since <laughs> he's the author of the paper. So I'm going to duck out of that question and I will ask Dr. Mr. Pandey to answer that question. Good. If that's you. okay with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we don't leave the KYs out of the skin. All the KYs, we substitute them with screws. So there are no KYs. And even the RESH technique, the, the wires were under the skin. The, the block was, uh, it was put into the block and it was cut under the skin. So you could mobilize them. And I agree with you sort of completely that if the wires are out of the skin, they are a nightmare because they do cause uh, pin tract infection. So as long as, as, as uh, if, if we are using wire, cut them under the skin and replace them with screws. And that's the best way forward. Uh, I think we can take this last question uh, from Keith uh, for Kapil saying, what suture material do you use for these tuberosity repairs? I use number two fiber wire. Thank you. I think uh, Sunil, we uh, should move on. Um, I think the next talk is going to be uh, from Dr. Jab Willems. He's a senior 
shoulder surgeon, internationally renowned so shoulder surgeon who's played a big role in education, in shoulder surgery education in India. And also he is a very good friend uh, at Leicester. Uh, so he's going to talk about replacement options uh, for proximal humerus fractures. Thank you, Sunil. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank Radhakant, Arvinder and Sunil for joining, for participating in this very interesting webinar. We'll talk, I'm going to talk the next 10 minutes about replacement options. Dr. Neer from New York was the first who invented the prosthesis for shoulder fractures. He was quite happy. 20 and 30 years later, he reported outstanding results with respect to pain and range of motion. But later series, especially from Europe, were a bit less optimistic, rather poor range of motion in many series and quite a frequent painful shoulder. So the results of hemioplasty in fractures still remain poor and rather unpredictable. If the tuberosity is healed, you can expect good results. If the tuberosities do not heal, which occurs in about 50% of the cases, you have a rather poor function. And actually no one has been able to reproduce the good results of Dr. Meir. Basically there are four problems with the hemiarthroplasty. Prosthetic malpositioning, especially hate, but also too much retroversion, a not suitable prosthesis with excess of metal, a poor technique of tuberosity fixation, or damaging the vascularization of the tuberosities. Inadequate length restoration is quite a serious problem and quite often happening. It's either too high or too low if you look to the series. It has been recommended to use the distance between the pec major and the, and the top of the humeral head as a standard measure of 5.6 centimeter. But basically in the human body, so much differences in length, there is no standard measure. So I think it's much more helpful to use this trick. Look to the medial calcar under the head. Measure this distance. That distance is lacking in the metaphysis of the humerus. Consider this when replacing the, uh, and, and re when placing the fracture prosthesis. Put it in the proper height here and don't go too low. And that is very easy to use in daily practice. I can't imagine that in this sort of prosthesis, tuberosities will heal so much metal. So look for a prosthesis with as little metal as possible to make place for a tuberosities to heal. And bone doesn't heal to metal, bone heals to bone and heals to bone. That is the basic principle. But if you don't fix them properly, you can have detachment of the minor or the greater tuberosity and you ex can expect a very poor result. So fixation of the tuberosity is ex extremely important. Cerclage with whatever material you use is important. Just fixing it to the bone and to the prosthesis is not as effective as using the cerclage. And there are several ways to use it. You can find on YouTube several ways to use this method of cerclage. When using sutures, take care not to damage the circumflex, the medial circumflex from below the minor tuberosity and here this one is entering from below the lesser tuberosity. You can easily damage the arteries leading to resorption of bone as, as shown in this case. Well, since about 15 years reverse arthroplasty has become quite popular. In the first series the tuberosities were rejected and there was a high complication rate, especially dislocation. In the following series where they reattached the tuberosities, there were far less complications and far less dislocations. There is a recent meta-analysis comparing the reverse to hemiarthroplasty, and the RSA is definitely doing better, especially in function, antiflexion and forward elevation. All through the external rotations in the comparative series were, was the same. Tuberosity healing was also better in the RSA. And why do they heal better? Well, in the RSA, the center of rotation is, as you know, medialized. There is less stress on the tuberosities during healing, and there's more deltoid contributing to the abduction. So there's less 
tension on the cuff muscles as well. And why do they heal better? Well, in RSA, in early abduction, force transmission to the humerus is through the deltoid. In the hemiarthroplasty, the rotator cuff is quite active also in early abduction, putting more pull on the tuberosities, more tension, and probably less healing. Is healing of the tuberosities important? Well, this systematic review from the UK compared 382 shoulders with or without tuberosity uh, refixation. In the cases with healed tuberosities, there's a better, definitely a better antiflexion, better external rotation, and better constant score. Well, can we delay surgery? Can we wait and consider it after conservative treatment of ORIF? Well, it has been shown that the clinical outcome in secondary RSA is as good as in primary. All through, in primary, there is better tuberosity healing and better external rotation. Is the type of implant important? A recent uh, uh, systematic review, it is in print, compared the three different types of inclination in the reverse, 135, 45, or 155, and looked to tuberosity healing and outcome. And the 135 showed the best tuberosity healing. And the hypothesis is that there is a better restoration of the center of rotation and less tension on the repair. The postoperative adduction, however, is better with the 155. And that is also with the standard RSA, not in fracture healing, that the 135 decreases the abduction. Is there still a place for hemiarthroplasty? Well, in men and younger patients, I think you could consider an osteosynthesis. Men have less osteoporosis than female. So you can consider osteosynthesis, especially since the technique and the materials have been improved in the last 15 years. Well, in women and mainly all patients over 75 years, I think RSA is the first choice. But there might be a group, especially with a split head, a damaged head, or long time dislocated head, where you can expect AVM, that you can consider um, in the young, more young patient to use hemiarthroplasty. In younger patients, that's my experience, that is better healing of the tuberosities than in older patients. Well, in the Probably in the future, newer implants will help us. There are now two companies, and maybe there are more, probably I'm not aware of, where you can change during the surgery from a hemi fracture to an RSA fracture prosthesis. That makes it easier to decide during the surgery if you go for a hemi or for a reverse arthroplasty. But however, there is a caveat. Whenever you consider an RSA in an older, older patient, this very nice randomized control trial showed that RSA and versus conservative in patients over 80 years show no difference in outcome. So it's still a um, um, solution you should consider if it's really necessary. A small movie showing a little bit of technique that courtesy to Pascal Below who gave me this video. You can consider to reject the supraspinatus. You see here the both tuberosities, the biceps tendon. You remove the head, fix the base plate in the standard fashion. One with another long pad. Fix the glenosphere. Repair the humerus. Use the cyclage. He is using the so called nice knot. You can easily find it in YouTube. Very nice way of fixing. Making some drill holes in the humerus. Take care of the proper version of the prosthesis. Stand up 20 to 30 degrees, depending on your personal preference. This is a prosthesis where you can put in some bone in between. Fix it with cement, especially in elderly people, better to use cemented than uncemented. Take care of the proper height of the procedures, like in the hemi arthroplasty. Reduce it. And then fix the tuberosities. If you save the supraspinatus, you can close the rotating the fold. There is a big debate if you can leave the supraspinatus or remove it. 
in quite some cases, I just left supraspinatus. I don't know if it's really helpful. I think with this infraspinatus and subscap and the deltoid, you can achieve a rather good range of motion. Conclusion, the majority of the proximal fractures, they occur in the elderly. And if arthroplasty is indicated, I think RSA nowadays is the best solution. And consider, even in fractures, arthroplasty is soft tissue surgery. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you to Dr. Zappelens for that very interesting talk. Um, I'd like to start with a question. I think in Leicester especially, we have a concern that the reverse shoulder arthroplasty is associated with a higher risk of infections. Jab, would you agree with that? In your experience, they well, have in, a higher in, risk of infection. In, in using the RSA in a massive cuff tear or cuff tear arthropathy, there's quite a large dead space. And indeed, there is a higher chance of infection of that hematoma postoperatively. But with most of the tendons still attached and lesser dead space, I, heard, I didn't see any infection in my series in the reverse arthroplasty infections. So I think the, the risk is com comparable with a uh, total shoulder or a hemiarthroplasty. So I'm not that concerned on the chance of infection in the RSA with fractures. Um. There's a question here from <coughs> Krishna Kumar. He's asking, in trauma, do you do cemented or have you done uncemented as well? Well, I am used to, there's a debate, but I'm used in osteoporotic bone not to use uncemented. The reaming is a little bit more risky, uh, creating fractures perioperatively. So I use, and it's also in my standard total shoulder in the elderly people over 80, I use always cemented. I think BJ, you had a question? Yes, I had a question. I don't know what your preference for the approach is for your reverses. And do you uh, use a delta pectoral or a, a deltoid split for fractures? Yeah, good question, uh, BJ. It, actually, in all my primary RSA, I use the transdeltoid approach. Uh, in, in the massive cuff tear, cuff tear arthropathy, you can save your subscap and you can start rehab much earlier. And in the fracture, like has been shown by Kapil very nicely, the approach through the deltoid for fixing the fractures and fixing the tuberosities is much easier than delta pectoral. So basically, delta pectoral for revision cases, primary cases, all my RSAs are through the deltoid approach. Thank you. Sonil, do you have a question? Uh, no, I'm, I'm okay. Thanks. I'm just, just saying in interest of time, I know the discussion is very, very interesting. We've got two more talks lined up. Uh, Amol and Amit. So yeah. if you permit, we can move on to Amol's uh, talk. We do, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, uh, Amol basically needs no introduction. He is a very well-known shoulder surgeon. He has special interest in shoulder trauma. He has delivered talks uh, on uh, clavicle fractures previously on international platforms. So we're very grateful that he's sharing his views again with us for benefit of all. So I'll share Amit, uh, Amol's talk now. Thank you once again to Amol. Good morning, I'm Amol Tambe, uh, and this is my take on uh, clavicle fractures. Many thanks to BIOS for uh, arranging this meeting and for inviting me on the faculty, and thank you everyone for joining in. So Hippocrates um, consigned clavicle fracture management to benign neglect. Uh, however, clavicle fracture management has uh, come a long way since, and we now recognize problems with pain and disability, or as Jesse Jupiter puts it, we are not meeting our patients' expectations. So to this end, let's look at uh, these two cases, patient A and patient B. And this is my first tip, get good x-rays in two planes. You see the AP view in both of these cases and the fractures look reasonably aligned, uh, good enough for conservative treatment. But then you take the 30 degree oblique view and what you find is that while the alignment remains uh, pretty much similar in uh, patient A, in this case, patient B, there is significant displacement, which is highlighted when you've taken a different view. In combination with the fact that this patient also had 
uh, quite a bit of skin tenting in the supraclavicular area, he required plate fixation, whereas patient A did well with non-operative treatment. Hence, the importance of having two x-rays in different planes, which allows for better fracture visualization. So what do we know about clavicle fractures? We know that fractures that are conservatively treated have higher non-union rates, and the fractures take a longer time to heal. Whereas those fractures that are surgically treated have better outcome scores, they have early functional recovery with relation to work and return to sports, and have a higher satisfaction rate. The Swedish Fracture Register in 2017 showed that there was a 705% increase in operative management of clavicle fractures over the period of 2001 to 2012. This shows that there has been a massive increase in surgical fixation of clavicle fractures. This is driven by evidence which in the last few years has come about in a number of well-powered and well-structured studies. So this is my second tip, read good evidence. Uh, I've got a little list here uh, and you can uh, reference to this if you want to look uh, at some of these studies which are uh, really a good read. However, what you need to be aware of is that the early functional gains that are seen in uh, fixation of clavicle fractures they diminish by one year, such that there is no difference in long-term functional outcomes between conservative group and the surgical group um, over a period of time. Some studies have shown higher complication and reoperation rates with open reduction and internal fixation, and this typically comes from metalwork problems where plates have to be removed, um, um, and this increases the reoperation rate. For the plate fixation group, the cost-benefit analysis of this intervention has not really been defined properly as yet. And we still don't know what degree of shortening is problematic or bad. Patient expectations is, is a big thing, and a lot of what we do is uh, driven by patient expectations. Uh, Novak in this uh, study in 2004 showed that a significant proportion of patients still don't consider themselves fully healed even at nine or ten years uh, and a lot of them maintain pain at rest or during activity and of course cosmetic issues persist. This brings us to the question then of does clavicle malunion, nonunion or shortening does it really matter? So Kim looked at the, the issue of malunion by undertaking this 3D scapular kinematic analysis, and what he found is interesting. He found that clavicle shortening of more than 10% greatly affects the way the scapula will move on the chest wall. Um, and this is probably one of the first studies that has quantified the amount of shortening that results in the problem. So this is my third tip, look at the scapula. And why do you want to look at the scapula? Well, this chap is a 48-year-old manual worker who presented with a clavicle fracture. We decided to treat this conservatively. Uh, this has gone into a non-union. However, as a result of the non-union, this chap has a prominent uh, protraction of the scapula. You can clearly see that it is not sitting, the scapula is not sitting in the right place. And as a result, he's also developed limitation in abduction and elevation. So unless you look at the scapula and work out if there is a problem with scapular um, uh, motion, uh, you will not recognize the extent to which the clavicle or the clavicle malunion or nonunion is causing a problem for this patient. We have all seen uh, problems with plates and plate constructs, uh, with uh, plates breaking, pulling out, uh, or screws pulling out. And the question then is, do the new um, pre-contoured plates, um, do they really make a difference? And do they make our life easier? 
So what we're trying to answer here is uh, that where the clinical outcome is affected by the type of plate. So this is my fourth tip, choose your metalwork wisely. Uh, Al Zarani uh, showed in 2018 in his uh, level three retrospective study that there was a 31% implant failure rate and he looked at different plate constructs. He found that the 2.7 and 3.5 reconstruction plates were more prone to problems, especially by deforming or breaking, whereas the pre-contoured anatomical plates did quite well. So once again, choose your metalwork correctly and wisely. Uh, here is a, a patient, this is an interesting one. Uh, this chap gave us a good uh, practice for plating. What you see here is a clavicle fracture which was deemed um, displaced enough to have a uh, plate fixation, which you see on the upper right hand corner. A uh, year down the line, he fell and, break, uh, and broke the clavicle medial to the plate fixation. So he had this revised uh, with another plate. And then in another 18 months, he came back again, at this time with a further fall, and the clavicle now broke lateral to the plate fixation. So he ends up having another long plate. Um, and now at the end of three years, I look at the series and think, um, would he have been better just by treating the fracture non-operatively? But that's a, a discussion for another day. So tip number six, Choose your patients wisely as well. It would be nice if we had some pointers or predictors that gave us an indication of clavicle union. Uh, this was a study presented by Robinson and team uh, from Edinburgh at the BEST meeting last year. And they looked at four significant predictors. They looked at the quick dash score, smoking, callus formation, and movement at the fracture site. And what they found is that when the quick dash score was less than 40, the, they observed a 95% union rate. However, when the quick dash score was more than 40, there was a 32% positive predictive value for non-union. And this is significant. In Derby, we have tried to follow a similar model. Uh, we have looked at fracture shortening uh, and uh, using a cutoff of 15% shortening um, as, a, as a value that distinguishes between uh, two groups, and I'll come to this in a second. But we use this technique described by Matsumura to work out the extent of shortening. Since uh, this is a proportional measurement, and this is an objective measurement, which is undertaken on the AP X-ray, this, uh, this can be measured by anyone uh, in the team, uh, senior or junior and this is fairly easy to work out. What we found that those patients where the fracture shortening was more than 15%, we had five symptomatic non-unions all requiring uh, fixation, whereas we had only two asymptomatic non-unions in the group where there was less than 15% shortening. We also worked out a time to union in our cohort, finding that in those patients where there was a significant shortening, which is more than 15%, this group took a significantly longer time to heal than the group where there was minimal shortening. However, when we undertook fixation in this shortened group, the healing time reduced from 18 weeks to 13 weeks. Again, significant with a p-value of less than 0.05. We also found that the quick dash score was significantly better in the ORIF group compared to the non-operatively treated group in the significantly reduced, uh, in the significantly shortened clavicle fractures. This led us to formulate this pathway, which is being trialed in our clinics. We work out the percentage shortening, and after excluding fractures that are deemed to be absolute indication for fixation, we then treat all those that are shortened less, less than 15% by a simple polysling and referral to physiotherapy. Uh, 
However, all fractures of the clavicle that are shortened more than 15% are booked into a clinic for a discussion uh, um, regarding a surgical fixation to reduce the chance of a non-union and a, a longer healing time. We are also working um, uh, on uh, these three predictors, uh, which is uh, lack of callus on the AP X-ray, fracture mobility when assessed in the clinic, and a quick dash score uh, of more than 40, which is associated with a non-union. If there are less than two predictors, clavicle fractures in this situation are left with open appointment. But if there are more than two uh, or equal to two predictors, then we uh, are going to book these patients back to the upper limb fracture clinic, again, for a discussion regarding uh, fracture fixation management. So this is my last tip, uh, which is use a, a, a pathway or a guide to help you manage clavicle fractures and at least have a, some kind of a baseline that helps you to plan fixation for those who uh, will do best um, uh, with uh, open reduction and internal fixation. So to conclude, uh, I'm going to go through the seven tips. Uh, tip one was to get good x-rays in two planes. My second tip was to read good evidence uh, and work on it. My third tip was to look at scapula because scapula will tell you problems uh, that may be emanating from a malunion or non-union of the clavicle and help guide surgical management. Choose your implants uh, wisely. Use plates that will uh, not fail and use plates that are uh, of a low profile so they don't cause irritation and you don't have to go back again to remove these plates. Choose your patients wisely too, and I've shown you why. And lastly, use a, a pathway or a guide to management which will uh, help you inform the clavicle fracture management. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Amol. Um, <clears throat> I will start off with questions. So do you actually mobilize them differently if you fix them? Do you move them early? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, morning all. Uh, yeah, so uh, the focus of physiotherapy really is, uh, it, it doesn't change majorly in the, the two groups. The focus is to get the shoulder moving. So in the non-op group, they're asked to rest arm in the sling uh, probably for the first week, 10 days. But the focus also is to get them moving at the same time. They get seen by physios approximately at the two week mark who will basically check that range of movement is established uh, and if not help them along. Um, there isn't any major physiotherapy intervention, however, it's mainly advice. In the surgical group, uh, again, with the focus of getting them to move early, once the pain from surgery has reduced, I'm happy for them to move in a full range, even overhead. Uh, pretty early on, uh, and they come out of sling um, pretty much quickly for activities of daily living. Uh, only things like heavy manual work or um, contact sport, uh, that is left for about eight weeks, approximately. Thank you. Amol, can I ask you very quickly, I think, first of all, thank you very much for that, those tips. They are really, really very, uh, very useful for all, for, for I think, junior and, and experienced surgeons. I, I see that you're relying quite heavily on your shortening um, rate so if the shortening is less uh, more than 15 percent then you tend to fix them is do you think there is hard evidence for that because there was a paper published last year for the meta-analysis on shortening does it affect clavicle healing uh, and uh, malunion and symptoms and apparently the, the outcome was it doesn't so yeah have, so what, what's your take on that yeah no that's 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 interesting uh, there, there there is a lot of evidence this way and the other way um, which exactly is why we also looked at how our patients were doing, which is why we went back and saw our group of patients. And clearly we saw that patients who were shortened, they were taking longer to heal. We did have five symptomatic non-unions in that group that eventually required surgical fixation. Uh, and the, the number 15%, we have not pulled it out of, uh, of air. It is based on a few study, studies, Matsumura who has described the method of measuring clavicle shortening. He also showed that when there was shortening more than 10% or more, there was more problems with scapular uh, uh, dynamics for, or, or uh, kinematics, for example. 
And we use that reference figure not to say that everyone who has that shortening should be fixed. That is a reference that puts those patients in a group where a discussion will be then undertaken and surgical fixation would be tailored on the basis of that discussion. Almost like so, a triage. Yeah, this pathway is not about fixing more. It is about fixing the correct people and giving the right advice and making the right choices. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Amol. Uh, Havinda, shall we move on to the next? Yeah, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Amol. So the next speaker is. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, is, is uh, Amit Modi, and Amit Modi, again, he is uh, a very well-known shoulder surgeon from the Leicester Shoulder Unit, and he is more known ab about his rotator cuff uh, graft jackets, uh, but he is uh, today talking to us about other fractures around the shoulder, which we have not discussed, such as scapula. So over to uh, Amit's talk. To this uh, BAS webinar. Over the next uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to try to demystify fractures of the scapula. This is not everybody's piece of cake and not uh, everybody sees uh, too many either. These are relatively rare fractures and account for 3% uh, of uh, fractures of the upper extremity around the shoulder. So putting in perspective, the incidence is similar to calcaneal fractures. Traditionally, these fractures have been managed uh, non-operatively with the general feeling that they do well, but we know from recent studies that this is not so, and malunions of these fractures tend to do rather poorly, both functionally in terms of pain and in terms of uh, movements. What's important is that these are high energy injuries and have got multi-system involvements. So in assessing these fractures, you have to go through the ATLS protocol and realize that uh, it is the other life-threatening injuries which are obviously going to take precedence over here. Things like uh, subclavian vessel ruptures that can cause torrential hemorrhage and uh, pneumothoraxes can also be life-threatening. Other injuries associated with these uh, fractures include cervical spine injuries, head injuries. Up to 50% have got upper extremity injuries of the ipsilateral side and brachial plexus injuries account for about 15% as well. For assessing these injuries, it's absolutely essential to have good radiographs and uh, CT, has, CT scanning has really transformed the way we look at these fractures, helped our understanding and helps planning management. Acromial fractures, uh, uncommon, generally treated non-operatively unless the displacement is more than 10 millimeters or there's an angulation on the Y view. The treatment options would be either a plate or screw fixation or tension band wires. With the reverse shoulder arthroplasties, the stress factors which you see are less favorable to surgical fixation and the outcomes are not great. Coracoid fractures, again, two types, uh, basal fractures and tip fractures, generally treated non-operatively unless uh, they cause a symptomatic non-union or a part of uh, other associated injuries. 90% of uh, scapular body fractures will fall in the so-called minimally displayed group and are well treated with uh, conservative management for short term of uh, being immobilized in a sling and early mobilization. There are a number of indications where, uh, which would require surgery and we shall uh, see these over this period of this talk. The concept of uh, superior shoulder suspensory complex was introduced by Goss. So compo components are four bony bits, the glenoid, coracoid, acromion, and distal clavicle, and the soft tissue components are the AC and the CC ligaments. So if there is a double disruption, which can entail either two bony components or a combination of soft tissue and bony components, it's an unstable construct and is not dissimilar to a floating shoulder, which was first described by Hervos Herkovsky in 92, uh, which uh, he defined as a fracture of the scapular neck with an ipsilateral clavicle fracture. Now this is an unstable construct because there is dissociation of the appendicular skeleton from the axial skeleton. Even the floating shoulder does not necessarily require surgical treatment uh, unless the displacement is more than a centimeter. And if it is uh, more than a centimeter, the option would be the treating just the clavicle or fixing both the scapula and the clavicle depending on which is more significantly displaced. Here's an example of a floating 
shoulder, fracture of the distal clavicle with a glenoid fracture, CT scan shows there isn't any significant displacement and this can well be managed non-operatively. Glenoid fractures account for about 10% of scapular fractures and surprisingly incongruity is well tolerated. But this is not to say that uh, they should be managed non-operatively. A CT scan is absolutely mandatory when you're treating these fractures since uh, you know, it helps us understand the fracture morphology and helps in our clinical decision making. There are a number of classifications in Vogue, though not all of them are purely descriptive. And probably the one described here, the Eidberg one, is probably the most commonly used one. A couple of uh, radiological parameters which help your decision making that commonly talked about is the glenopolar angle, which measures the inclination of the glenoid in relation to the body of the scapula. And there's the angle formed between these two lines drawn from the upper and lower part of the glenoid and upper and lower part of the scapula. Anything less than 22 degrees is an indication for surgery. Another indicator is the lateral border offset, which uh, tells us the displacement of the lateral aspect uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the scapular body in relation to the proximal bit. And a displacement of more than 20 millimeters is an indication for surgery. So if you look at scapular uh, fractures, an articular step of more than five millimeters, any fracture associated with glenohumeral instability, Rim fractures accounting for 25% of the surface or posterior rim fractures accounting for 33% or more are, are indications for surgery. And the extra indica article indications would be a GP or glenopolar angle of less than 22 degrees, a border offset of more than 20, or an angulation of more than 45 degrees or a combination. The approach you use for fixing these fractures depends on where the fracture is. Uh, delta pectoral is a good workhorse for fractures of the anterior rim. Posterior approach provides you good access to the glenoid uh, and, uh, and, and the scapular neck. But the approach which has really transformed the uh, treatment and uh, especially surgical management is the Jude approach, which gives you complete access to the whole, whole of the scapula. It's not necessary to do the full approach. You can uh, create windows to gain limited access either to the medial or the lateral borders. So let's take an example here of uh, Heidberg one, anterior rim fracture, elderly lady who came, fell off in a garden and felt a shoulder sublux. Uh, X-ray shows a rim fracture, CT scan shows uh, minimal displacement, and this can well be managed non-operatively. In contrast, this is a younger individual with a similar fracture, but the CT scan shows a significant step off, and this required a screw fixation from front to back. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm hiding the image here. Now, this uh, is a fracture which uh, was the first one I dealt with after I completed my fellowship. It's about nearly 19, 20 years ago. It's an Eidberg II, significant displacement. So this was approached by a posterior approach, and you can see, uh, being my first venture, fixation is not very robust, but uh, you know, got, got a good articular alignment, and he went on to do reasonably well. The option would have been to put a superior to inferior screw. This is a more comminuted fracture. So this person came off a motorbike and uh, sustained this injury. CT scan showed the uh, Eidberg four fracture exiting on the medial border, but uh, the glenopolar angle is well maintained. There's no significant step off and this is managed conservatively. In contrast, this is a similar fracture, again, a high energy injury. And you can see the amount of displacement, uh, which is over here, uh, which is quite significant. And this is well seen on the CT scans. So this was uh, accessed by a posterior Jude approach and uh, fixed the glenoid uh, neck with a plate and screws and uh, the medial border with another plate and went on to do quite well. He continued to have some creaking noises, but the CT scan showed there was no interarticular encroachment. Now, this is an interesting case because he was referred to my fracture clinic about five years ago for a routine follow-up following a tuberosity fracture. X-rays didn't look right, so on questioning him, he told me he was in ITU for about two months, uh, six months ago, after being involved in a horrendous RTA. He lost his spleen, he had a functioning ileostomy, he had a pneumothorax, and in general was lucky to be alive. 
And you can see these reformatted CTs which were done uh, shows significant displacement. You can see the glenoid is completely off uh, from, from the main structure. And sort of interest, uh, I got an MRI scan done and you can see that uh, the humeral head is centered on some tissue which has uh, reformed. And he had a very satisfactory function and clearly through what he had been, he was in no mood to have any intervention, which is rightly so. So I'm not remotely saying that these fractures should be treated non-operatively, but uh, it can be forgiving at times. Outcomes, uh, Nordquist was first to show that uh, not uh, all of these fractures do well non-operatively and uh, Cole and Anavin have shown good surgical outcomes. So generally the take home message, uh, these are high energy injuries, look at the life-threatening injuries first. Conservative management is an option, but uh, there are certain indications and uh, on the right side where the GPA is less than 22, where there's angulation, there's a significant offset, these fractures should be considered for surgery. In general, the evidence is rather poor, but uh, I think common sense should prevail over there. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Amit. Um, it was a difficult topic, but he's done uh, good justice to the topic. Uh, Amit, start off with a question. You know, when you see such a patient, what do you, uh, how do you counsel them for, you know, what likely outcome they're going to get after uh, these fractures? Right. I think uh, the groups are generally self-selecting. The ones which are minimally displaced and displaced which are going to treat non-operatively, they will generally go on to do well and probably get most of their function back. Is the displaced ones uh, where I think you've got to be very realistic of uh, what you're trying to achieve and what the outcome is going to be. I think first and foremost, I think the patient needs to be told that it is unlikely he's going to get most of his movements back. There is going to be a restriction. Uh, they are likely to get arthritis uh, in the longer term, but uh, you know having done arthroplasties for 20 years, I'm still to do an arthroplasty in somebody who's had a previous glenoid fracture. So even if they do develop arthritis, it's probably not necessarily that uh, they are probably symptomatic or actually come down to surgery. And obviously they need to be warned about uh, the risks uh, to the nerves and uh, vessels, I think. Thank you. Sunil? Uh, I've got no questions. I'm just very much aware of the uh, the time we've overrun. I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Amit for this wonderful, uh, you know, pearls on scapular fracture. I'm all for his clavicle talk, Jap for the proximal humerus replacement options, Kapil, uh, Monty, Allison, Mr. Hark, and uh, thank you to uh, yourselves, Harvinder and BJ, for uh, helping us uh, drive this. Jap Films as well. We can't forget him. He's uh, helped us understand so much about proximal humerus fractures. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, thank you, every, everyone. I mean, the recording of this uh, session will be available on the YouTube channel of BIOS, and we aim to send that to you through a link. Otherwise, if you just YouTube BIOS, you should find this talk so that you can go through these talks because there's a lot to take within 90 minutes, and all these experts in their fields, they have dis discussed these uh, uh, the, these injuries quite in detail and you'll get a lot more tips uh, if you go through these talks again uh, in your own time. So thank you very much and uh, with your permission, uh, Havinda, shall we bring this to a uh, close? Sorry, Sunil, we did need to thank Manish. This was his brainchild. Absolutely. Yes, of course, uh, Manish, was... our educational uh, secretary and supervisor for BIOS, uh, this is brain child, obviously, and, and we be very grateful to him for this and our upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, thanks to everybody. 